I think the skill is you're able to articulate your policing skills into uh, a civilian work environment. Yeah. yeah. That, that, that would be my view. I, I, I would encourage anybody to, if they're thinking of leaving the police, quite, I don't know how long that, I don't know whether there's any research to suggest how long that process is from I'm fed up with this to leaving. I suspect it's probably years. It is and for me, how years. I feel that time was to do a degree. And I, I would say, uh, if anybody wants to talk to me about doing a degree, now I didn't work shifts, but as you know, I, I had some challenges around health and and you know young, you know trying to do it with the young family as well. Um, I'd, I'd be happy to share how I you know managed my time uh, in in relation to that. But yeah, you don't need a degree. Hi, and it's fantastic to have you on the Blue Light Leavers podcast. A real honour. You spoke in the Academy a couple of weeks ago as well, and that went down so well. Feedback with that from that was brilliant. And uh, it's great to have you in the group, and it's, it's brilliant to have you on the uh, on the podcast. Well, thanks very much for inviting me, Andy. Uh, as you know, I, I, it's a real privilege to be invited to uh, to do this. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm, you've had much better people to me than interviewing, but, um, you know, I'm really honoured if I can help in any way. So thank you. Oh, mate. I'm, I'm sure that's not going to be the case. You've got such a, an amazing story to tell. So um, I, I think people will really get a huge amount from this. And it's, it's a really, um, you know, the area that you've moved into, the career path that you've taken yeah. is is really growing, isn't it? So uh, yeah. so we'll go through that in a bit more detail a bit yeah. later on. But um, before we do, would you just give us a bit of a, an introduction to you? And um, if you could let us know what you're currently doing, and yeah. then we'll go into your policing history, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Well, um, I'm currently a senior lecturer um, at a um, London university, uh, and I've been at that particular organisation, well, for the best part of a year now. And before that, I was a senior lecturer at another university as as, as well. So, uh, and I, I, I moved universities for really just for um, logistical reasons, not, not for any sort of bad experience. And that's kind of the position that I'm in at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, we'll, we'll go into the the journey yeah. that you've been on. But the um, <clears throat> excuse me, the what was it that you were doing in the policing, and and did you do your full service? Yeah, I I did my full service as in full pensionable service. I was, I was in the military police for um, nine years, and then decided sort of I, I suppose later in life, which is really where a lot of my decisions are probably. Uh, traditionally, uh, compared to others, I, I've made some uh, important decisions in life a little later than I suppose the, the so-called normal. Um, I was in the military police and I got some good experience there, but sort of in my early 30s, I felt that, and there's no disrespect to the services at all, but for me, I felt like I'd outgrown, it, I'd given what I thought I could and I wasn't getting much, much out of it. So I, I decided that I just wanted to leave. Uh, and, and to be honest, I left to go into a, a job. I returned to retail. I started my, my working life in retail and I, I worked at a supermarket in uh, Lisbon in Northern Ireland and, and remembered why I left <laughs> retail in the first place, if I'm, if I'm honest with you. Mm -hmm. And it was there I got an opportunity just to come and work in London, just doing some uh, what, what was described as security consulting, which I would describe as house sitting, which was, if, if I'm honest, was well paid, but incredibly boring. And I, I decided at that point to... Um, joined my local police force, not, not, not where I was working in London, where, where I grew up. So I joined, joined my local police force uh, there. And be because I'd, you know, I'd, I'd made some wise decisions by chance with my pension, it meant that I got full pensionable service. So my, my military contribution, I transferred that pension in, plus my police pension meant that I could retire on a full pension um, after 24 years service with my, 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 my local force, if you like. Um, so yeah, that, that that's really uh, my 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 policing sort sort of experience. I spent spent the last I suppose the last um, significant number of years uh, working in the learning development department. You know they go through different names, training if if you will, um, and that, that's really how I <clears throat> how I ended up in police. If I'm honest, I ended up in policing quite by chance. You know I just just wasn't wasn't happy doing the security work and. It was a little bit of a risk, but, you know, and, and if I'm being honest, I know, I know some people don't have the same experience. I had mostly good experiences mm -hmm. in the police, um, mostly. And there's, there's some things I, we, we can delve into those if you want to. I had mostly good experience. And and I, what, what I try to always acknowledge is it's because of a lot of that experience um, I was able to get to where I am today. So some of those um, 
um, qualities and skills that I've got, I was able to map across to to what I'm doing now. Mm. I think um, <clears throat> very similar to me you, you, yeah. academically <laughs> at school. I mean, I, yeah. I left with I left with four uh, four U's. I ended up doing a lot of retakes. So, yeah. uh, and I think you yeah. were you were similar, weren't you? Yeah. Well, I I, I dare I say we're of a similar age. And uh, we, we, you and I probably did something like O levels and CSEs, and I was. I'm not going to confess up to that. I'm not going to confess up to that. Yeah, it was CSEs, but I got a load of U's as well. So academically, I didn't stay on at school. I left mm. school and went to work on a youth training scheme at um, this, this say before I joined the army mm. uh, in a in a big superstore near near to where I was living at the time. Uh, and again, that 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 whilst I didn't enjoy that ultimately, that that gave me some some skills that I was able to exploit throughout throughout life as well. Did you do um, some further learning in while you were doing the um, in the L and D role within the police? Did you do yeah. any additional qualifications or anything like that at all? Yeah, I did. Um, what, what, one, one of the things, um, quite quite often, um, and this this is kind of like hearsay evidence to to use the term. Quite often you hear of some forces where learning development is a role where they just put people just because they're on long-term sick or some issues around that but certainly in the force that I worked in it, it, it was a it was a proper you have to apply to get into that role and um, we we didn't no, nobody really had any training qualifications so if I say so myself it was me that sort of mooted the idea that we all sort of engaged on a training qualification that, that was fully supported by by the l d sergeant who undertook it as well and at the time, all the trainers sort of ended up doing a um, certificate in education, which on a, an academic framework sits at level five. And that, that gave us something that's now uh, it, it's a diploma to teach in the lifelong learning sector. So it, mm. it's more than an introductory. Um, so it, so it's um, so that's what we did. Uh, that, that was well supported by the department. Uh, in there. Personally, myself, um, towards the end of my career, because I started to have an idea of where I wanted to go in L&D with the introduction of uh, police professionalisation, which, which, you know, I don't, don't think this is the place to get into the politics of that. Um, but I decided that I, I wanted to give myself some added credibility because I knew I wanted to apply for jobs in that. Uh, and if, if we get that far in, in the interview that, you know, you, not all universities expect you to have a degree, uh, but there is a little little caveat. But I wanted to do a degree. So I self-funded uh, a degree in policing and I went to Canterbury Christchurch University to do that. So I did that whilst I was uh, working full time um, yeah. with with some what I've described as passive support from my department. I, I, I think at the time it didn't feel like I got any support. But now that I've reflected on it, actually, um, I, I did get what I've described as passive support in, in relation to that, but not financial support, um, mm -hmm. which, which at the time I felt disappointing. And then I got over it. And then then I, I got, got a really incredibly good experience at my first university where they funded after I'd left, they continued to fund uh, postgraduate qualification for me. And I suddenly thought the police didn't do that for me. And I still yeah. had three years service to go. So I felt a little bit, you yeah. know, I, I felt oh, that that. That, that that wasn't that, that didn't feel particularly right or nice actually in hindsight but i'm over it you know yeah, yeah. almost i'm clearly, talking clearly about not it. Yeah, yeah clearly not <laughs> i'm still talking about it yeah. i'm still wondering whether i can put a claim in for it but, uh, but at the time the university mm. that i did my degree uh, heavily subsidized the course and they, they work quite a lot um, with with um, with a, a lot of police forces, so um, because it was a country, you, you know, you can guess the majority of the forces that were attracted to that university. But I chose that uh, just out of reputation. It gave me what I wanted mm -hmm. uh, to do. That mm -hmm. I know, um, obviously, from conversations we've had previously, and and, and obviously we worked together, um, you know, after you as you were coming to retirement and stuff as yes. well, didn't we? So yeah. uh, we'll talk about that in a bit more detail later. But um, um, but you also came across um, you also had some pretty significant health challenges as well didn't you and it'd be it'd be helpful to for people to understand you know that balance of um you know health well-being mental health all those sort of things that go along yeah. with it as well because it's yeah. really impactive I know that and it and yeah. um so it'd be helpful to know that Ian and obviously yeah. then how you managed to balance everything that was going on your day job yeah. and, and everything else yeah. I, I, I think as a, as a result of the health challenges, which which I'm happy to divulge, um, mm. and you know, sort of uh, viewer discretion is, is is advised about some of the detail, perhaps that I'll give, um, is that yeah, it was horrendous. In in the year 2001, I got diagnosed with a bowel condition called um, ulcerative colitis, 
And uh, so, um, uh, as I say, with my medical condition, uh, viewer discretion is is advised because it's some some unpleasant details, uh, which, which I am happy to disclose. Um, I used to write about it anyway in a blog. But um, in the year two thousand and one, I was diagnosed with a serious bowel condition called ulcerative colitis, and uh, it, it nearly killed me. I mean, literally, it, it nearly killed me. Um, and um, just, just to give, give some ideas, and whilst, whilst I know this isn't a medical podcast, I was trying to work full time. And at the time, I was still on shift at that diagnosis before I moved into training. Um, and I was actually, uh, I tell you, I was working on a pro, proactive team. And I, you know, given it's a bowel, bowel condition, you, you, you put your, your, your listeners can fill in the gap. I was going to the toilet nearly 40 times a day. That's four zero times a day. So you can imagine that and it you know it was it was diarrhea uh, but blood mostly blood so I was losing blood uh, therefore there were some issues associated with that with things like fatigue um, iron infusions that I was having as a result of that and it kind of settled down after about an initial year but you know a, a nod to my sergeant and if he's listening he knows who he is he, he was very supportive uh, of my condition and I you know and I, I think you know whether whether or not there was any pressure on him from above i don't know he certainly protected me uh, from that and he was very supportive of my condition um only because i suspect that he had a relative who had a similar condition uh to do that but but the reality is i it, it kind of settled down i mean none, none of the treatments worked and it kind of settled down itself it never really went away so i live with frequent trips to the toilet but nowhere near 40 so you know when i was having what was described as a flare-up um, but I had had good support with that, but it was hard. It was very hard to start with uh, in relation to that. And it kind of settled down. And as you know, I was um, involved in some other training. I was doing defensive tactics. So I had quite a physical role um, as, as well in relation to that. And my, my return to work was was very supported by, by the sergeant I mentioned. And then, of course, things moved on and it settled down. Um, and then about 2008, it all came back with a vengeance, much, much worse than it was before and I was I was on steroids medical steroids and um, I was I was on high doses of medical steroids and that in itself um, had an impact and then um, in 2011 I had uh, extensive surgery uh, to help manage the condition I won't say cure the condition to help manage this condition and I ended up with a stoma a bag temporary stoma a bag um, while, while some of this stuff inside was healing because I was refashioned inside um, and um, the, eventually everything was reversed. There were some issues with the bag because that didn't work properly. My kidneys failed. I was back in, I spent three months in hospital during that time. Um, oh, and again, again, um, with, with colleagues, I didn't sergeant this time. I was actually, um, at that point, I was working full time in the training department and I had tremendous support from sergeants and colleagues. Anything above that, it, it didn't feel like uh, I was anywhere on the radar. And it's, that's, I don't know whether that's a criticism or, or, or not. I felt supported by my colleagues and I wasn't pressured um to get to get back get back to work and um you know so so that was good but it, I, I spent three months in hospital and my recovery um took two years to you know two years and, and even now even today so I've, I've had what I call I've got an, what's called a J pouch internally so I've had that um since 2011 and even now, it's it's not the same as, you know, a healthy person's physiology as well. So I live with that. So I still go to the toilet frequently, um, um, but I, I don't have the associated um, other symptoms that go with a full on full on colitis. I still get fatigued. I still spend a lot of time sitting on the toilet. Um, but, um, you know, it, I still work full time. I studied for a degree during that process. Um, I had to had my first children first first one aged 47 second one aged 50 yeah yeah I know <laughs> so so um, and it's challenging every, every day is a little bit of a struggle because of the, the background kind of health and I think touch wood physically you know it's felt like sometimes my body's falling apart uh, but mentally I, I've been you know I'm not a religious man at all but I think feel fairly blessed to have fairly robust mental health although I've had a few glitches along the way mm. uh, I've ne never felt um, I, I, I've never felt maybe, maybe I, I don't know maybe I have maybe, maybe it's just my generation but I've never felt that I've um, I've struggled you know compared to my to my physical kind of uh, uh, health but for most mm. people you know it's it, well, what I describe as a hidden disability and it does it is limiting sometimes you know in terms of social events and 
evenings and and, and just so I, I try to manage my time and I obviously if any of you view, uh, listeners have got young kids then I don't know how demanding that can be but other than you know my health I wouldn't, wouldn't have it any other way uh, mm. so that, that they were the challenges I've faced so on the whole generally supported locally at, at that level um, in, in terms of general police welfare well I, th- I think most of your listeners will have their own experiences um, certainly whether they think, I, I think sometimes it's a tick box exercise in policing. Uh, but I, I was sort of like fortunate to have the right people around me at the right yeah. time. Well, yeah. Whether that's consistent, I don't know. I doubt. I doubt it. Yeah, and that can make such a difference, kind of the right support yeah. and the right yeah. people. And it, a, bit, a lot of it is luck. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it shouldn't mm-hmm. be. And that, that, that I suppose mm-hmm. that you, you make a good point there. I don't think it should be. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think there's still a long way to go. I think, I think. Yeah. Even at the top, I think there's some well-intended, um, well, well-intended messages. But by the time it gets filtered to where it should be, um, you know, e- e- you know, ser- sergeants, inspectors are un- under their own pressure as well. And what wasn't not making excuses that you know they, you, you take the pay as it were. You know, that's the great. You know, you, you take on that challenge. But I, I, I do think they have their own challenges as well. Mm-hmm. No, absolutely, and, and that's incredible, really, to to still go on to accomplish what you have. Um, in spite of everything that's, yeah, that's yeah. you know been going on, is uh, is it's, it's just, you know really extraordinary. So so very well done. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, it has been it has been a challenge, but mm. yeah, it's you know I'm still I'm still here. I'm still on the right side of the turf, as it were. So absolutely, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Long long that long may that be the case. Yeah. Yeah. The um, so if we move now towards the end of your service, yeah. And um, and obviously, you know, we had a number of conversations to me around that time as well. Yeah. So just talk yeah. us through your thought process. So obviously the L&D route uh, in some form was the, the correct path for you. And that was identified yeah. quite early yeah. on. And obviously you did, you know, the, you did the degree and, and the Sir Ed as well. And um, yeah. um, so you knew that was the, the, the sort of the obvious career path to take. Yeah. How did you feel coming up towards the end of your service, Ian? And, and, um, and what did you do? I, I coming up towards the end, I, I think it was at the five year. I, I got a little bit stale, and I think think I, when when we did the Q and A the other night, I think I said that on there. I, f- I felt a bit stale in the police, and even, even at Ellen in, in the L and D. Um, but as I say, you know, I don't I certainly don't want to make this negative too negative about the police. People have you know people have different experiences. I felt a little bit stale, and it was at the five year point that I thought lots of people always said, you know, your, your time will go really quickly. Your time will go really quickly. And it kind of dawned on me that I, I kind of had an idea of what I wanted to do. Um, and I, I got the opportunity to work with the first um, new entry routes into policing as liaison uh, at the local university. And it kind of relit a fire uh, for me. And I thought and then it was at that point I decided that I didn't want to sort of just transition as a former police trainer into the local university. And there's nothing wrong with that path at all. Um, nothing wrong with that. Um, uh, people have, uh, have managed to exploit that in a good way. Uh, but I didn't want to do that. I, I wanted to, for me, it was about my own credibility. Uh, so whilst I had experience as a police trainer, um, I also wanted to, if you like, put myself in the position of doing a policing degree. And it was a theory-based degree, so it's mostly based around criminology. Um, so I, I wasn't nervous, certainly at the five year point, I wasn't nervous, but I decided I needed some focus and I knew to do a degree, I needed time as well. And given the, my, my medical or my health background, I knew, knew I would need to you know, think about how I was going to fit that in around you know, having young kids, studying for a degree and spending a lot of time in the loo, frankly. Um, yeah. um, but Leading, leading up to that time was fine, around the five-year point was fine. Um, and then I knew, I was, as I was studying for my degree, I, I knew that I was going to need to start to do things like networking. And that's when I started, and things like CV, stuff that I'd never, I'd never had to apply for. I hadn't applied for an external job, you know, in all, all the years, you know, 20, 24 years. And I, and I think that's when I started reaching out to you because, you know, your, your reputation, your good reputation had preceded you around your transition from policing into um, civilian life, if you like. Um, so I reached out to you because I, I think one of the things that I was a little bit nervous, reticent of is things like networking mm-hmm. and how to do it. And it turns out I was okay at it. I, I didn't really know, you know what to do. So I started just um, through my studies really um, because I wanted to study not just to tick a box and get the degree. I really wanted the underpinning theory around criminological theories and policing theories. 
So I started just reaching out. So I was reading and the same names were cropping up around what I was studying. So I just decided to email a few of them and they kind of got back to me. Um, and, you know, that that led, you know, that led to some really good opportunities um, back at back at that time. And also recently as well as a result of the network and I did. And it was just pick it up. You know, I'd, I'd drop an email to somebody because you always find an academic email address. You just go onto their university, search staff profiles and it's there. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I had nothing but a positive experience with networking. So I was getting information for my studies, but I was also getting a feel for life in academia and and I, and I said on the um on the Q&A we did the other night um that it's not for everybody um it that you know most most universities like the police are big organizations um and they can be bureaucratic and they can be a little bit resistant to change uh, but my own personal experience is that um um I, for, for me I I my, my working environment is far better than it was than when I was a police officer you know, and I, I, I had a fairly, you know, privileged position Monday to Friday, if you like, whilst I was in training with the odd, odd, reluctant <laughs> operational shift of modest. But um, um, but but yeah, so it was it, it was a nervous time, certainly. But I was quite excited about it as well. I was quite excited. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I started thinking about it. And I, I suppose anybody about thinking about leaving the police at whatever stage of your career is to, you know, start thinking about what you want to do and work towards that for me setting a goal of doing a degree really kept me focused on it and actually put the time in of what what I describe as sometimes some quite mundane kind of um environments I was in and I you know I think that's fairly normal you know you spend spend that time um in there in in those positions so I felt a bit stale as I said previously so it kept me focused so I, I I got quite excited by it and I started applying for jobs and reaching out to posters of jobs a year in advance just to talk about their positions not that I was going to apply for those jobs and I got some really positive responses and sort of say you know I'd sort of say my start date isn't for another year and a half but I'm interested in in the posts and you know they, they would sort of say you know well keep it keep your eye out for other adverts nearer the time um, and I, I would say that's a really positive thing if you see an advert um, and they've got the contact details um just drop them an email and, and have a 10 minute chat with them you know so mm-hmm. I, th- I think it you know for all the right reasons puts you puts you in their in their mind as well and that works absolutely. Very well for me absolutely it really really does and, and it is just a small step and it's yeah. just doing something a bit different isn't it and, yeah yeah and of course they remember you know in a year's time when you get back in touch and say oh you know we spoke a year ago and uh, yeah you know so you've got a vacancy come up and that relationship has already been yeah. built you're not going in cold so it does make yeah. a massive difference um so that first opportunity that came up in um yeah. And obviously, we we went through uh, uh, some of the interview process and stuff, didn't we? Work yeah. together to, you know, around yeah. that interview process. So, how did that first opportunity come about, and how did you feel about it? Right, uh, it, it was really um, I, I, we we'd set set our mind on moving away from where where we live. We, we wanted somewhere. We we live in quite a rural village, uh, not, not village town, a, a rural town, but it, it's quite uh it, it's nice um but, but we wanted something you know we're conscious of our own own children really so we wanted somewhere a bit cosmopolitan so we chose uh to head down to um the southwest uh bristol and we thought we could do that and i i, I researched the universities in bristol and one of them um uh, one of them um was advertising and, and ran, sorry wasn't advertising at the time but one of them did the police programs um so i knew somebody who worked there so i'd met them uh, at, at a previous um, university where they'd worked before and so I just thought I'm going to email them and I, I just sent out a speculative email to this person sort of saying hi hope you remember me from and I got a re- and just really interested in your university where you're working now and are you applying are you advertising anytime soon and um, would you consider an application from me? And they they sort of emailed me back sort of within the hour and sort of said, yeah, I've just spoken to my boss um, and adverts going live this week and we'd welcome welcome an application from you. Um, so so that, that was a little bit lucky and it kind of just, so the planets aligned in terms of where we wanted to move. Now, of course, you know, we didn't move for, 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 um, uh, for, good, re- for good reason as well. And that, that's mm-hmm. partly why I moved from that, that institution, that, mm-hmm. that university ultimately. Um, and so I went through the application process and that was pre-COVID, the application process. But during that process, between submitting my application and waiting to see whether I'd got an interview or not, COVID and lockdown happened. And, mm-hmm. you know, everybody's world, including the universities, 
um, turned upside down, you know, so universities um, and the police were busy transitioning where they could to everything online, mm. uh, like most workplaces were. And I didn't hear back from the time, um, the, the time scales that were on the advert. And initially I thought that wasn't, uh, that wasn't a problem because of COVID. And then the, the, um, the, the inter- interview date that they said in the advert had long passed. And I thought, oh, I'm wondering whether they forgot. And I remember reaching out to you and saying, what should I do? And you said, just give their HR a call. Um, so I did. And they said, yeah, we hadn't hadn't forgotten about you and ended up um, getting an interview date. And that, I suppose if, in, in terms of being the most nervous about about everything uh, was at that point, you know, in terms mm-hmm. of living, because n- then I had to go through a process, uh, step out of my comfort zone, uh, to use, use the phrase, um, to, you know, go through that interview process, which is where you, the Blue Light Leavers um, site, had really, I mean, the support I got from you personally, uh, was second to none so you know which Thank you know you. Have, happily go through go through that process as well you know once, once we've got my interview packed through that's very kind of you mate yeah if just yeah. if you just highlight so people understand the, the type of processes that that you go through in terms of that interview prep as well so you know whether anyone yeah. reaches out and wants to do it or not they'll still yeah. have a bit of an idea on the on the, the process that you go through yeah so so all, all thank, thanks to you, really. I, I focused on, so, so most, most interviews or, or, or most job applications will have a set of essential criteria and they'll have some um, desirable criteria. And I, I think there's an expectation you should hit the, the essential criteria uh, with, with a sort of like, in, in some cases, you know, if you reach out and have the right, right conversation with the right people, that, that, that might be, um, can, you, you know, you might be considered um, um, but but also one of the things that I learned from from talking to you is was actually to look at what you were being asked to do in terms of communication and networking that, that don't sit within that. So in terms of your day to day responsibilities. So I'd, I'd, I applied for the job without support. I did that off my own back and I sort of just used in, you know, how I'd apply for the job with the police and that seemed to work. But it was the in- interview and it, and it was it wasn't three conversations. Uh, it wasn't until three conversations with yourself. Um, that there were different types of interview, you know, whether it's just like a relaxed conversation as we're having now, whether it's a panel interview, whether it's competency based interview. And I ended up on a panel, a panel interview, uh, ultimately. But I think what, what really paid off for me for that interview was spending that night before talking to you online and focusing on what they were asking me to do in terms of my my communication, how I'd fit into the organization, networking skills, um, above all things like um, you know, every, every university wants to know that their students, regardless of how, you know, whatever course they're on, are safe in your hands. So they, they were interested in, in that. And, you know, you, you said something which, which I've heard a number of times since from other people is if you get the interview, they, they feel that you're good enough to do the job. They just want to know that they can work with you and maybe just mm-hmm. confirm or just check on it on, on, a, on a few of your claims that, that you've made on your application. Mm-hmm. Uh, in relation to that so that that process so I, I went through how to structure my answers I went through the the um, scenario of when they say tell me a little bit about yourself and you, you've got that mnemonic um, you, um, I, I can't form. form is it form that's, that's it. the one yeah I still remember it so you've got that mnemonic so I, I'd rehearse that as well so that's a little bit more of a natural way than sort of I'm mean, inerring um, I touch base with uh, Charlotte Eve um, on, if I'm okay to give 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 a absolutely give a mention, give a absolutely mention here. of course and, and whilst I didn't um, whilst I didn't need a CV for the uh, my job at the first uh, university I went to work for um, I, I did one as part of my I, I had I, I didn't do it sorry Charlotte did me one as part of my retirement plan and um, and what what I would say is the combination of the support that you gave me. And how Charlotte wrote my CV, you know, I'd learned my CV for, for want of a better word. I mean, it was me, so it was easy to learn. And I was able to structure my answers around what she said in the CV. Now, the university had never seen my CV because they didn't, didn't ask, ask for the CV in relation to that. But my, <clears throat> my, my interview, um, I would say, was horrendous. I, I, I didn't enjoy that experience at all, for, for, I think for good reasons. One, when I was very nervous, it was the first time I'd done an interview for a job outside of the police uh, for many years and it was one of the first online interactions that I think anybody had had so it was on zoom and it was a panel interview and I, I, I was probably 
dare I say, the most competent person on there in terms of tech. So there's a few tech issues to start with. And um, the, the opening line, it was, I remember it, my interview time, I was the last person to be interviewed. And um, the, the interview time was 4.30 on a Friday afternoon. So I had to oh, sweat wow. it out from, yeah, for, for an entire week. And the opening line from, from the, the head, head of the panel was, uh, we, we don't intend to spend long with you, um, probably about 20 to 25 minutes. <laughs> and I, of course, now, now mm. of course, as it turns out, that, that was a good thing. But of course, given mm. the pressure I was under, I just assumed they just take, they, they're just going to put me through this process just because I've applied, you know, and maybe because I've tick reached out to somebody that I ticked yeah. the box. And so it felt really stilted, the interview. And um, I'd done lots of prep and I, I would, wouldn't change anything, although it turns out I didn't need half the stuff that I'd prepared for. But I, mm. I was I was confident it was in, in and in retrospect, I'd done the right thing because I'd rather been in a position where you know, because I wanted to tell them everything. And of course, they're not interested in absolutely everything, as it turns out. They, you know, they don't want to know every single example I've got of good communication. They perhaps just won for it, you, you know. Mm. Um, but I had a big list of every, everything on there. And that that was, you know, you know, having that having that prep around me. And because it was online, I literally had sheets of A4 paper with my notes on sellotaped around the shelf that I got behind me. Yeah. And, I, and I told them, I told them I had some notes that I might refer to as well. So I was, you know, I said, if I look away, it's because I, I have got some notes because uh, I, I want to make sure that I, you know, mm. um, do that. And so uh, for some very stilted, formal kind of questions around um, um, safeguarding, teaching experience, my knowledge of the programmes, the policing programmes, um, diversity and inclusivity. And it was all very quick. It took about 20 minutes. Mm. And I, I, I just sort of logged off. And I, I think I texted you or phoned you and sort of said, well, it's done, but it's over in 20 minutes. And I said, I didn't have a good feeling about it. And, I, you know, I, I'm definitely you know, not going to get it. And I genuinely meant that. And I genuinely thought that. And um, but but a week later, I applied for a lecturer's job. A week later, um, they phoned me up and offered me a senior lecturer's job, which, which is quite an unusual step for, for somebody's first. I suppose it's not my first uh, dip of my toe in the water into academia because I worked as an associate lecturer at my local university as part of my policing role as well um but it, so I took it I took it and then of course came the next challenge was negotiating my salary because I've never had to do that yeah. before yeah. so um I didn't accept the the uh, lowest offer and I, I negotiated I, I had a figure in mind and I actually got offered slightly more than the figure in mind um for that for that job um, and it was, yeah, in some ways it was a baptism of fire, the transition. And one of the hardest things for me, um, I think, was a little bit of imposter syndrome because I'd worked as a PC. And, um, I, th and I think, well, whilst I was, I, I described, you know, some an old sweat, you know, I'd been, been, been long enough. I was still a PC and there's, there's still very much a rank structure in policing and there's quite often your ability is associated with your rank which mm. isn't the case and that, that's one of the downsides mm. to a rank structure you know some mm. police officers and some you know police service seems to like the rank structure but I think it disrupts relationships and disrupts people's view on you but somebody so somebody who'd been at that position uh for a long time I was suddenly trusted uh, and I was suddenly my my opinion was oh yeah we'll do that you know oh, we we thought we'd phone you up for some advice on this mm. um, so so it, it was a little bit felt a little bit strange so I spent my first few few weeks in a state of worry because I was working from home wondering whether I was doing enough where it got to the point where I, I said I'm going to phone my boss <laughs> so I phoned her and I said just because I knew her that she was the lady that I'd reached out to she'd subsequently yeah. been been promoted and I phoned her. And she asked, and I just sort of said, look, I've not heard from you. And I just wanted to know wh whether you think I'm doing okay. And she said, well, funny enough, she said, I, I, I was thinking that I never hear from you. And I said, oh, is that a bad thing? She said, no, absolutely not. She said, every, every report I've heard, you're, you're doing fine. So whatever it is you're doing, keep doing. But she said something which, which was really resonated with me. It's something I keep in the back of my mind is be kind to yourself. She, she said, don't take on too much, you know, because I was trying to, you know I was trying to impress as you do when you're when you're new mm. so she said mm. just just remember to be kind to yourself and so I always keep those keep those words in the back of my mind so that's where I ended how I ended up into into academia mm. oh, that's amazing and um <coughs> you know it's it's 
I, I love those conversations and it's lovely you know seeing where you've gone from there as well because yeah. things have, have you know moved on even from that point as well and yeah. um um so mo more recently where are you and what have you what are you doing okay so we decided not to move uh that that was a simple thing so i decided to re regrettably to um uh, part company with with uh, my, my first uh, university uh, brilliant place to work um, and you know, I you know highly recommend highly recommend it as as a nice work environment. Uh, but if, if I'm being honest, I, I think I'm in a better place, um, you know, in a work environment for a number of reasons. So I decided to look for a job in the new year. That 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 was last year. But I saw a job come up, and I looked at what they were asking for, and I, I wondered whether whether I was up to it. But I reached out to uh, somebody on that, a really productive conversation with with somebody who's now a colleague and a friend. Uh, and decided to apply, um, and um, so so I work work at that that university, and and the when I when I say it's a better place in terms of what I get out of it, I um, I work four days a week, so my my contract is a thirty five hour week, which is compressed into four days, so I either work um, Monday to Thursday or Tuesday to Friday, so it's on a rolling kind of thing, so I always get a long weekend every. Mm -hmm every two weeks within within reason sometimes to do some extra hours uh, and that that's the nature of sort of academia and I was offered I applied for and got a senior lectureship again and I got uh, as you know a significant pay rise uh, I got an incredible pay rise um, which 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 means that because there's still a bit of a commute it, and uh, it, it means that I can afford to do that um, and um, and because I have a police pension as well so financially although like like everybody else the cost of living crisis and probably a little, little bit vulgar to talk about money the, the pay rise was good and it was important and that was one of the things that attracted me to that university in terms of where that university is in policing programs it's not, slightly not as developed as where I was before uh, so it's still a, a work in progress so it's got some challenges around that um, but uh, I you know I, I was a module leader at my old university and I, I lead on a couple of modules here uh, but one, one of the things I, I've been able to free up where, where I couldn't uh, before is I now have some time for personal development and in fact, it's actively encouraged. So, and that was the same at, at um, where I was before. Um, personal development was encouraged, but I didn't feel I had the time to do it. So I en ended up um, working long hours and not really progressing. So I was on a postgraduate program uh, and I didn't finish it when I was there. But when, when I went to my new university, I was able to finish it. And it, here's the thing, where I was be at before, agreed just to keep me on the books and to fund it. So I was working at one university wow. whilst another university. And that, that's where I sort of linked back to wow. um, where, where, when I was in the police, where mm. funding for my degree was declined in year one. Where, where And the message I, I got back was, oh, uh, you're retiring in three years, so we're not going to support you. And, and the, the sort of polar opposite approach from that university says, we'll, we'll pay for that. So as a result of that, I finished my qualification. I attained, um, I was on associate fellow, so fellow, uh, now full fellowship in the Higher Education Academy. And I'm now on a pathway to senior fellowship um, wow. where, I, where I work at the moment. That's incredible. Um, could you just talk us through um, quite <laughs> briefly and around sort of a day in the life of, so yeah. what does your job entail? Okay, so as a, as a senior lecturer, uh, there's a lot of administration. Okay, you can't escape that. So there's a little bit of bureaucracy around that. So just just in terms of making sure content matches what what, what min, uh, minimum content standards, um, less lessons are, are all pedagogical, pedagogically sound. Um, so so they you know it's principles of scholarship of teaching and learning are applied to everything adding content to a virtual learning environment um, so that students have access so we don't have to print out loads of handouts and other, and, and other bits and pieces. So there's an administrative side, but that's not just for senior lecturers. We'll have that as well, dealing with emails and, and, and other bits. Um, universities are in the lecturing, teaching, learning business. So there's a lot of preparation. <clears throat> there's some teaching. There's marking. And I, I try to block out time as well for self-development as well. That not, mm. might necessarily reflect across all organisations, but for, from where I'm at the moment. Um, for me personally, because there's a commute, I'm on campus roughly seven days a month in teaching blocks of two to three days. And then for the rest of that time, I'm either on annual leave, working from home, doing those other, other things like writing and prepping uh, for lessons. But, but lecturing pretty much is 
is prep teach mark um and then add to that some um uh, some administration as well mm -hmm. but, uh, excellent yeah, that's really helpful just so people get a bit of an idea on what because they yeah. might think, oh, this, this sounds like a great role, but actually you don't, yeah. know, don't know what they do or what it is that you're doing. So I, th I think think to just to, to say it's hard, I find it hard graph, particularly lecturing with, with my health health condition as well. Mm -hmm. Um, because you, you, you can be on your feet for whole days. So traditional university course, you know, a lecture might and I'm you know, they'll they'll be doing other things. I'm I'm not dissing my colleagues on more traditional programs, but they might have a teaching program where they might go in for a couple of hours one day, a couple of hours another day. But when we're teaching, uh, certainly on policing programs, it's it's sort of like um, nine to five ish uh, in class with, with with some breaks <clears throat> as well. So so it is quite hard, but both physically and, and mentally as well. Uh, so it's not a cushy number, and um, and it's not for everybody. Not not everybody enjoys it. No, uh, but but I think as I said on the. Um, q and I, I don't know a police officer who's got got the right approach who couldn't do it i you know i you know you, you should, usually exceptions apply but you know gen, generally speaking in terms of regard forget rank take rank out of the equation um i, I think there's plenty of police officers um look, looking at the skill set regardless of rank or role that could do it yeah yeah that's really interesting. Thank you for that. And then um, something comes up an awful lot as well. And you see this with some of the organizations yeah. that they they demand that you, you know you must have a degree. Okay. Have you found that to be the case um when you're teaching in, in higher education as opposed to further education? Uh right. Um I, I haven't really taught in further education. Mm -hmm. Um, but if if I, I start with the starting position is if you're going to work at a university, they're in the business of degrees. That's what they do. They're, they're in the business of academic qualifications. And I would say you are best equipped if you have got or you work towards an academic qualification. That, that would be my my position, because it's not necessarily around the subject matter. It's around the academic skills about academic writing, trying to get published, academic referencing, researching and all those skills that you will need to have or learn either on the job. But if you've already studied at, at, at higher education level, you, you've already got some underpinning knowledge. Having said that, um, not all universities expect you to have a degree. They might ask for it, but quite often in, in job, job uh, adverts, they'll say minimum of a bachelor's degree and that that might be that there's no give on that. And then the next criteria might say master's degree or significant practitioner experience. Mm -hmm. Some universities will go for minimum of bachelor's degree or significant um, significant um, um, experience. But I wouldn't be put off without by reach reaching out because the reality is. Um, they need people with policing experience on some of these policing qualifications. That, that's mm. that's a reality, and you know there's 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 plenty of room in the pond, as it were, for everybody to swim mm. in at a minute. So um, they they need those qualifications. Uh, sorry, they need those people. You know yeah. whether you've got the qualifications or not. And I, and I think the skill is you're able to articulate your policing skills into uh, a civilian work environment. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that would be my view. I, I, I would encourage anybody to, if they're thinking of leaving the police, quite, I don't know how long that, I don't know whether there's any research to suggest how long that process is from, I'm fed up with this, to leaving. I suspect it's probably years. It is for me, how years. I feel that time was to do a degree. And yeah. I, I would say, uh, if anybody wants to talk to me about doing a degree, now I didn't work shifts, but as you know, I, I had some challenges around health and, and you, know, young, you know, trying to do it with the young family as well um I'd, I'd be happy to share how i you know manage my time uh in, in relation to that but yeah, no. you don't need a degree so, and some universities make that explicit but some universities and it really depends what they're looking for as well because we, we on our policing team we have what i describe as people who come just been in academia and they're absolutely brilliant uh you know that we're, we're no better than each other we, we all add a sort of dimension mm -hmm. to that to that uh position if you like mm -hmm. um I know you, as a result of, of some of the work that you've done, you've also had some amazing opportunities that have arisen as well, haven't you? Um, yeah, yeah, really, really quite by chance again. So somebody from humble PC or, or humble employees of Tesco, you know, back in the day to, so um, part of my networking strategy, um, you know, I had a networking strategy in the end, as it turned out. Um, I just got invited 
um, I got invited to a um, conference and for anybody who knows me, and knows an interest in languages, and I've got a reasonable smattering of Japanese. Um, and I found myself at a conference with a, a number of Japanese delegates. And, and, one of, and, and one of the delegates was the legal attache uh, at the time, legal attache to the Embassy of Japan in London. So qualified solicitor, ex-prosecutor, um, ex-prosecutor from back in the, sorry, something, something just flagged up on my screen now, I've cleared mm. it now, mm. uh, former prosecutor in, in, in Tokyo. And I, I, I decided to sit next to him and have a chat in Japanese with him. And then as a result of that, I ended up giving two presentations at the Embassy of Japan uh, in London uh, to some Supreme Court judges who flew over from Tokyo. And then a second one, I was invited, it must have gone okay. I was, I was invited back for a second one and I gave a presentation to the SPAT, the criminal justice system in the UK compared to uh, some aspects of Japan, uh, to some prosecutors. And then uh, as a nice kind of thing, I then got an in invite to a reception with a uh, reception party with the uh, ambassador, the Japanese ambassador in London, not just me, me, me and him, but uh, you know, a, 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 a big event. And that, that was Amazing. just before COVID. So, so we managed to squeeze that in, but also as a result of networking, I was able to, um, I got invited to uh, be what's described as the external academic on a course validation for another university, uh, which was a paid, uh, as a consultant, as a paid um, gig, for want of a better word. So I, I have those opportunities. And, and about a month ago, another um, um, deputy pro vice chancellor, somebody quite senior who I'd met previously, um, wants me to work as a consultant because their university is about to undertake a suite of policing degrees. So I've been asked to assist with that uh, as a paid kind of thing. So I've been, yeah, m m these these kind of opportunities. I, I don't know. I feel like they kind of fall at my feet, but I think when I look back at it, I probably did the groundwork to to um, you know with the networking to 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 do that. So. Yeah, so and the qualifications, good. incredible, yeah. honestly, absolutely yeah. amazing. I, that, that's yeah. so great. It really yeah. is. And uh, yeah, it's, I, I, I say this on every interview, but it, when I have an yeah. opportunity yeah. to chat, but you, you really yeah. should be so proud of what you've done, Ian. You know, obviously, well, that first conversations that we had around, <clears throat> I'm sat and interview help sort of thing. And yeah. then, yeah, you know, yeah. going, you know to, to where you are now in, in such a short period of time. And also from a salary perspective as well. And you've got the consultancy work on top of the salary yeah, as well. Yeah. So it's it's not all about the money, like you were saying, but it's just these amazing opportunities. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, we, we go to work for a reason. And, mm. and, and the, you know, and I know it's not, you know, it's, it's a little bit vulgar to talk about exact figures, but and I'm not going to. But, you know, it, it's nice to to go from that that position because and I suppose one of the other things I'm, I'm con conscious of the time that, that, that we were agreed um, is that perhaps somebody who is a senior rank who comes into lecturing that might feel like a step down to them. And that, that's absolutely fine. You know, they, they worked at such a high level with a lot of pressure. But for somebody who worked as a PC, for me, I relaunched my career. So I suppose I do look back now and I think, well, we yeah, are actually I have done OK. I still have imposter syndrome. I mean, mm. uh, and I'm about to, I've just, um, I've been approached by by a colleague on the team who's, who's offered to supervise uh, a PhD. So I'm, I'm just in the process of writing a research proposal to get on that pathway as well. Wow. I'm not quite sure how I'm going to fit that in, in terms of time, but I, I, I thought, well, it's about seizing the moment as well. I thought, well, mm. I'm surrounded by the right people, um, mm. you know, consciously and, and purposefully now put myself in uncomfortable positions and to you know be in the room with the right people where i'm looking up to them as it were as opposed to the other way around mm -hmm. yeah dr ian grant phd's well, got a nice got a nice ring to it as well hasn't it yeah well we'll, we'll, we'll see that, that's many <laughs> that's many years ahead we'll, 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 see. well done ian incredible ian well, thank well, you so much mate it's um it's, it's really incredibly helpful yeah. and uh yeah. you know the level of detail we've gone into as well is is perfect but it's yeah, um no. it'll it'll really help people to to understand if it's the right career path for them yeah. and the potential yeah. opportunities as well and and obviously with the backdrop of of some really significant life-threatening um, health yeah yeah well, well so. touch, touch wood everything everything's fine everything is Great. you know i manage day to day to day i, I would describe yeah. myself as in good good health um you know despite the underlying you know things that are always going on in the background as it were but uh, yeah no incredible well done well done great yeah, talking to you and thanks ever so much yeah, for your time. really appreciate it brilliant
Yeah, what I completely forgot to do was ask how people can connect with you. So <laughs> if, uh, if anyone wants to reach out, and also you, you've, you've very kindly offered to help as well. So uh, um, so if anyone does want to connect with you, what's the best way of doing that? Uh, well, there's a number of ways. So if any, anybody in the Blue Light Leavers uh, group can just message me on Facebook, they'll find my, find my profile on there. I'm also on LinkedIn as well. They can do a search for me. If, they, if they're linked to you, Andy, they can, they'll, they'll find me through, through that connection as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then, you know, if they want to make the connection, we can, we can swap numbers or, or uh, email addresses. And if anybody wants to, you know, have, have, uh, further dialogue than the usual kind of brief exchanges on, on social media, uh, then they can. And also you can get me on Twitter as well, if you look hard enough. <laughs> Great stuff. All sure. right. Well, thanks so much for your time. A brilliant, no brilliant interview. Very much appreciate it. And look forward to catching up again soon. Likewise, Andy. Thank you. And massive thanks to Ian for his time. And uh, I really hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. It's uh, There's obviously quite a bit of humour in there as well. And uh, he's just such a great guy. And he's, he's a, a real advocate for the Blue Leavers group. And he's, he's helped out with the Academy as well. Um, so don't forget, uh, please leave a review on uh, Apple or Spotify or both. Do both if you like. And, and um, uh, you can also join the private Facebook group if you haven't done already, which is facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Blue Light Leavers. Loads of information on the uh, bluelotleavers.com website as well. And um, if you want to join the Academy, the doors will be opening on that uh, very shortly. And that's a, uh, a monthly membership and um, we get loads of help and support. If you need that help and support now and you want just want that bit of information as live Q&As with subject matter experts and like Ian and others. And we talk through CVs on LinkedIn and um, you know, skills and experience and mapping them across and all sorts of things. So there's tons of information that's available through the Academy and you can contact me about that through Andy at bluelotleavers.com. Great having you here, as always. I really appreciate it, and um, and I hope you enjoy these um, and, and get so much from them. And um, yeah, thanks for listening. Really appreciate it, and a massive thanks to Sam, as always, from Right Royal Audio, to uh, who, who does all my uh, editing and gets rid of all the mistakes for me. So uh, very much appreciated. We'll catch you again soon. Take care. Bye bye for now.